Kia ora koutou katoa. Uh, my name is Jessica Moran, and today I want to talk to you briefly about some of the work that we've been doing to raise awareness about born digital content is important, cultural heritage and material, and most importantly, to an extend an invitation to all of you and your institutions that we could perhaps work together to ensure that Aotearoa's born digital cultural heritage doesn't disappear. Um, as you may be aware, the library has recently released its strategic directions to 2030. The library identified three strategic areas, reading, knowledge, and Tonga. Within these strategic priorities were the two statements on the slide. One, born digital content reflecting contemporary New Zealand life and knowledge will be readily available for access and research. And collections will reflect the diversity of the people of New Zealand and the Pacific and the importance of Māori as tangata whenua. Um, both of these statements speak to me, and I see them as actually intimately intertwined. They're also driving the work that we're doing within the digital collections team and across the library. But I want to note that, these are, these are, that neither of these statements is meant to be limited to the National Library. Instead, the real goal is that by 2030, cultural heritage organizations across New Zealand will have born digital content that reflects and is representative of New Zealand. To explain why I think this is important, it probably helps to first have a little bit of a shared understanding of what I mean by born digital and the place of digital records, digital media, and digital objects in our current society and culture. Born digital resources are any items created and managed in a digital form. That simple definition comes from OCLC. Born digital resources are essentially all the stuff that we create and share digitally. Um, born digital is no longer new. People have been creating, managing, and accessing digital content at least since the 1970s, and we're now in our third decade of ubiquitous born digital life. But there's still sometimes that sense that born digital is still too young, it's too early. Um, but email has been active and been in active use since the mid-1990s. People have been creating websites and been on the web since 19 sent as well since the 1990s. Um, as Thomason mentioned, Google's 20-year anniversary is this year. 1998 was 20 years ago. That might not seem that long ago. Um, but last week at the Internet Web Archiving Conference, Ian Milligan noted that 20 years after World War II in the 1960s, we expected historians to write about World War II. It was utterly reasonable. But is it reasonable for today's historians to be able to write about in the 1990s without access to born digital records, whether those are Word documents, emails, or websites? Um, but there's more to this than just ensuring that historians have access to rich primary sources. The way our society has changed and expanded has also changed and expanded who has access to communication tools. Where in previous generations, gatekeepers such as newspapers, publishers, music labels, and movie producers controlled who had access to technology and whose story was heard, digital technologies and digital platforms have reduced those barriers, allowing more voices and more diverse voices to be heard. Um, with like a little asterisk about the growth of big tech and um, four platforms kind of controlling things, but put that to the side. So <laughs> um, if we want our collections to matter, they need to reflect the diversity of the people of New Zealand and the Pacific and the importance of Māori and Tonga, as Tonga and Whenua. And if we want our cultural institutions to thrive, they must continue to adapt and ensure that our communities see themselves reflected in our collections and exhibitions. If our job is to document, describe, and contextualize our social, cultural, and political worlds, then we need to be engaged in collecting our past and contemporary born digital worlds. Um, as the National Library has been working through some of these issues, um, we've kind of been thinking about a few things, or at least I've come to two conclusions. One is that a small number of people in the National Library is not enough people to be collecting born digital. No matter how hard we try to build dynamic, diverse, and representative collections, there aren't enough of us. And even if there were, one, two, three institutions shouldn't be responsible for collecting a, a nation's cultural heritage. That's just too many biases and too many blind spots. There are a number of institutions that are getting started in the last few years with collecting in this area, and we're so happy to see them and join them in our community, um, and we want to work with them, and we want more people be, to be doing this. So please, join us. Come along with the ride. It's a great place. Um, and two, even if there were three or four times as many of us, we still need to convince creators that their digital creations could potentially be future archives, um, even if they never actually enter a cultural heritage organization. This is actually a digital literacy issue, and I think it's really part of our job to teach these digital literacies. 
So we've tried to take a three-pronged approach. We're continuing to build and grow our own internal digital collecting program, developing and uh, growing a series of workshops for colleagues across New Zealand to get hands-on experience with some of the tools and processes for working with born digital materials. And I think we had a really great um, workshop with about 25 people yesterday. So thank you for all of you who came along to that. And three, a series of public talks and programs to teach um, the public communities, digital creators to care for their own personal digital archives. So some of our most popular initiatives that we've done have really been these pro public programs around personal digital archiving. And there's clearly an appetite for more of this kind of information. Personal, personal digital archiving is a necessary digital literacy skill for the public to have, so that even if digital content turns out to be important, someone's been preserving it, even if it's not us. Um, and I think that actually in the digital creators panel earlier today, there was a really good point about somebody saying it would take like a year out of my life at this point to try and make sense of what's in my personal archive. Um, and you know, if we have some basic skills on how to do this a little earlier on, it might not take a year out of someone's life to do that. So we've increased some of the info on our website, and we have a blog post coming out with some more information about how to look after digital archives, personal digital archives. We've also talked about um, producing a webinar for librarians and archivists and others who might want to deliver this kind of programming at their own institution, as well as a day or even a series of days, if there's appetite, um, that are devoted to personal digital archiving, where we open the doors to the library and invite communities to come in and get some hands-on experience. But we also want to ask you, um, would you like to partner with us, first of all, to deliver this kind of programming? And two, is there something else that we should be doing, something we've missed? Um, and finally, social media is another kind of born digital content we need to be thinking about as workers in digital cultural heritage. At the library, we actually have a lot more experience collecting Twitter than Facebook. But look how much bigger Facebook is than Twitter. Worldwide, um, there's somewhere around 2.3 billion individual users um, of Facebook and about 2.9 million in New Zealand. And that compares to Twitter's 300 million worldwide. It's apparently about 9% of New Zealanders use Twitter. Um, because we're still learning what Facebook archives look like and how we might collect them or if we should be collecting them, we've been exploring a donation-based Facebook pilot that we're going to begin um, early next year, we think one in which we seek donors' permission to collect their content. I'm giving you a sneak peek of this project because I would love to hear your feedback or its support. Um, perhaps you have ideas of people who want to donate their Facebook archives, or perhaps you have people who we should collect, or perhaps you even want to do a similar project, a sister project at your institution. We're not sure how many Facebook archives we'll receive as a result of our open call, but we do know that talking about this project, we're providing information to the public about all the personal digital content in their own Facebook accounts. How to get that Facebook, that Facebook content out of Facebook the platform, how to manage and care for that content long term. Essentially, we're continuing to have that digital literacy conversation with New Zealanders. And no matter this response rate, we know we'll learn something about Facebook archives and our relationships in our society to our social media accounts and what it looks like when we bring social media content into a nation's uh, institution's collections. Thank you for listening. Um, please do get in touch if you're interested in more information or you'd like to work together. Kia ora.